spent a year at Oxford in 1970-71. Um, after the 1973 coup in Chile, he returned to the U.S. and taught at Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, where he still is um, emeritus, is a professor at, at Richmond, and they have now returned to Chile. So Howard will fly from here on Saturday and go back home to Chile. Um, so Howard, it's really a privilege to have you here. Um, I've known Howard only for a year. Crane introduced me, and Crane and Howard go back a lot longer um, than, than we do. Um, but it's been really interesting to have conversations with you um, and to, to just draw on your expertise and your thinking. So we really look forward to today. The format is uh, in front of you. The program is Howard will give a half an hour's worth of lectures, um, of lecture. He's got a one-page handout that, he'll, that we've just distributed. Um, he'll speak to it um, uninterrupted, and then we'll go into small group discussions of three. And I think for um, you, you, you can, if you one or two groups want to move into the dining room next door, that'll be fine. But for half an hour, there'll be some discussion around both what Howard has said and what we've, um, we've read in preparation for today. Um, and then we'll come back for a plenary conversation. Um, and I'll be the, the strict timekeeper, if you don't mind. Um, and I know that because Howard and I had a conversation with Anya on Friday, we could talk for a, lot, a, a really a long time, but we want to get through some of the content that Howard has prepared. He's given the content as 13 lectures in Mexico City just recently, and so what he's been doing for the last week is condensing his 13 lectures into three, um, which I think is no mean feat. Um, but I do think that many of us have, have read um, those three papers that Howard um, has circulated, the Doug Popera um, paper and Howard's too. And we're going to be joined by Doug Popera at top of three via Skype. So when Doug wakes up, um, he's going to um, answer a couple of questions and give us a little bit of input. So we're very pleased about that. Doug is, um, not only is he the author of that article, but he's also the editor of the Journal for Social Behavior. And so we're just really also pleased to have him through his friendship with Howard. So how would you bring so many gifts to us already? Um, and so we want to thank you and welcome you and hand over to you. Um, I've um, suffered from a broken heart in my life um, more than once. And I'd like to begin by mentioning uh, two times when the causes of my broken heart have been social structures. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was the first uh, volunteer lawyer for the uh, Farm Workers Union in the United States that started in California and later spread to other states. Um, and when uh, Carolyn and I migrated to Chile, I gave my Volkswagen to Cesar Chavez, who was the president of the union. And in cleaning out the Volkswagen in order to give it to him, I was amazed at how much paper there was. There were so many projects concerning the union. It was amazing that doing all those things for the union, I was also able to hold down a job and be a graduate student at the same time. But it, it, we succeeded in organizing the uh, tomato harvest, which is the big thing in California. Um, that enormous pains, and if I do say so myself, with several clever legal moves, and the response of the growers to uh, our organizing a tomato harvest was twofold. Uh, first, they moved the tomato growing operations to Mexico. And secondly, with the help of the uh, Giannini Foundation of the Bank of America, they uh, invented machines to harvest tomatoes and made tough skin tomatoes that could be harvested by machines. Uh, both of these um, I wanted to call structural. It seemed to be the right word to say it was structural that they could uh, choose to cite their operations in any of 193 countries and choose which uh, laws they were going to obey and what labor force and they could choose a less organized. I also wanted to call it structural that they could do without labor altogether and replace it with uh, technology. Uh, I wasn't really very entirely clear what I meant by structural, but that seemed to be the right word. Uh, at another time, I uh, lived through the um, 
military coup in Chile, uh, some of you who are older may remember that we had a socialist government in Chile from 1970 to 1973, uh, followed by a violent military coup and a long dictatorship. Uh, the first time I saw the program of the uh, Popular Unity, uh, I knew that it wouldn't work. Um, I knew that they were, the program was going to uh, discourage private investment uh, in ways that really it wasn't prepared to compensate by other ways of getting the work of the world going, and I assumed it would slow down and stagnate and either revise its program or be voted out of office, as has happened to so many uh, social democratic and socialist governments. Uh, as it turned out, however, uh, it did not, the economy did not slow down, it collapsed entirely. Uh, and it uh, did so uh, not because of the, uh, you might call the economic structures, which normally tend to produce a slowing down of the economy uh, when incentives of profit are low. Uh, it did so because powerful individuals decided to shut it down uh, for the purpose of regime change. Uh, I, I knew people in the army. Uh, and I knew that uh, it was very difficult for the people promoting the coup to get the full support of the armed forces, and it would have been impossible if it had not been for the economic uh, collapse. So I, uh, I attribute the, uh, the collapse uh, to structures. Uh, first, this, this sort of normal economic structures, which uh, tend to make production depend on profitability, and second, the political uh, mobilization uh, uh, to deliberately shut down the economy to overthrow the regime, which, which included, among other things, the United States selling its copper reserves to lower the price of copper, and the list could go on forever. Uh, with, uh, with that as a prologue, I want to turn to my cheat sheet and start with the word uh, necessity. Uh, by uh, necessity, I mean that uh, we don't have an option. Uh, it's not simply that uh, other economies would be desirable or possible, it's that they're necessary, that the existing economy simply cannot continue, that it must, uh, it must be replaced by some other form of economy. Let's stick with new for now. I'll mention Solidar and Unbounded in a minute. There are two sufficient reasons why we need a, I, I'll, let me mention, I'll note that the word economy is in plural, it's economies. Uh, it's, uh, it's more, we need more than one way of doing things, not, not a single way of doing things. Uh, there are two sufficient reasons why the existing economy is not one that can be extended into the future. And one of them is the redundancy of labor. Um, I, uh, my little experience with tomato harvesting machines is a sort of a microcosm of the macrocosm that uh, more and more human labor is becoming redundant as a factor of production. Uh, our entire uh, <clears throat> Our entire economic thinking and economic structure rests on the idea of what some people call the wage relation, that uh, most people will make a living by working. But when most people are redundant, uh, it simply uh, becomes a non-starter as an economic system. We have to, we have to, we have to rethink from the, the bottom up. Uh, secondly, the incompatibility of the dominant economy uh, with, uh, with life, that is to say, uh, the natural sciences, the physicists, the chemists, and the biologists uh, make it very clear what we have to do to, for the Earth to be uh, an, an environment where human beings can live. And we, we know what we have to do, but we also know we can't do it. And we, we can't do it because there is another imperative, and that imperative uh, is the imperative which some of us call uh, regimes of accumulation, 
Are you familiar with the phrase regimes of accumulation? Um, well, it began with the Grenoble School of Economists so with uh, Michel Aliotti and Robert Boyer. And the idea was that uh, uh, in order to function, an economy needs uh, a whole set of factors which assure that it will be worthwhile to invest. Um, John Maynard Keynes points out in his general theory that the, in, the weakness of the inducement to invest has always been the economic problem. And doing things to encourage investment has been what governments do and what they have to do because there's no choice. So everybody physically depends uh, on the confidence of, of investors. So it becomes uh, an imperative to do whatever has to be done. Uh, this was later elaborated by David Harvey um, and others uh, to a general theory of culture. And in some ways, Bourdieu and Passeron anticipated with respect to education. Uh, education, uh, everything, whatever, has to be compatible with the effort to keep the confidence of investors up because otherwise the system doesn't start. If it doesn't start, if there's no employment and no production, as, we, as I witnessed in Chile when the system uh, collapsed. Um, <clears throat> uh, Frederick Jameson says even the unconscious mind has to be compatible with the regime of accumulation. So these new economies that are necessary, what do they have to do? Uh, they have to recycle the surplus. Um, that's where the word solidarity comes in. They have to be economies whose purpose is to meet human needs in harmony with the environment. The, the presently dominant form of economy's purpose is accumulating capital and meeting human needs as a byproduct, which may and may not result uh, from um, accumulating uh, capital. But, uh, and a solidarity approach and an unbounded approach is one that says, well, we're solidarity because we take it as a first premise uh, in, in Martin Luther King's terminology, there were one human family living on one world house, which is a, the planet, and we're going to take care of each other one way or another, uh, and that's the solidarity principle. Uh, and if it doesn't work with markets, we'll do something else. So that's where the unbounded eye comes in. We're working together across sectors uh, to meet the goals of the societal enterprise, and we have a pragmatic approach to uh, doing what works uh, for that objective. Um, so it's necessary to move resources from where they're not needed to where they are needed. In fact, that's sort of a definition of a surplus is something that's not needed, one of the definitions. Um, and this has to be independent of selling yourself in the labor market. You can no longer afford to say that people only have a right to exist on this planet if they can sell something either the labor or something else in order to get money, in order to, um, in order to buy what they need. That uh, our governments are what Schrempeter Peter called um, Steuerstadt, Steuerstadt, and they're, they're tax states. They live by taxation. And the power of governments to tax is very limited, especially when they're competing with 192 other governments for investment. So the capacity of the government to raise money by taxes to provide dignified livelihoods for the millions of unemployed and the millions who will be unemployed as technology continues exponentially to make labor uh, redundant. This is already this is already happening. This is this the future has already started. Already the mines are being mechanized. Already in South Africa, 90% uh, of the jobs in the jewelry industry have been replaced by by 3D printers. Uh, so the the ethic that you have to work for a living which assumes that someone's going to buy your labor power simply uh, can't work anymore. We need a, a different, uh, different ethic and a, a different uh, social structure. Um, we have to liberate the earth from the physical dependence of the human species on regimes of accumulation. The NSU economies mean a different basic social structure. What do we mean by basic social structure? We want to say every culture has one. And um, the uh, word basic means it governs getting the basic necessities of life. 
Uh, it's, perhaps we're not saying anything very different from what Marx and Engels said in the German ideology when they said that social science has to start from the premise that human beings exist and therefore the means of their existence must exist. And therefore the, what they call the Körperliche Organisation, the physical organization of the means of survival has to be starting point for, for social science. Uh, the currently dominant social basic structure can be named in many ways. Study of the sciences are, retain their identity under different descriptions. There are many ways to describe the basic social structure, but it has an identity independently of how we describe it. Uh, Theodore Adorno in Negative Dialectics uses the expression Tauschprinzip, which I think is very helpful. That we, that we call it, we live by exchange. Our relationship with one another is of, uh, of exchangers. Uh, uh, Hegel even said the definition of person is the sitzer. A person is someone who is capable of holding property and, uh, and of exchanging it. Um, but with the, uh, with the understanding, when we talk about the Tausch Prinzip, that uh, uh, the type of property uh, position we're talking about is in the Roman tradition where property is, is domination um, as distinct from, for example, Mahatma Gandhi's view that property is trusteeship. Um, uh, in private law, the, uh, the basic cultural structure or the basic social structure, I use the words cultural and social. I don't want to give up either word. I don't have any very clear, consistent dis rule about when I use culture and when I use social. I, 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 I use both of them, and I think I, I, both are necessary. Um, this can be considered a, a legal matter. Uh, Gillian Rose points out that when sociology was founded, it largely took over categories that existed previously in jurisprudence. And if we take, uh, for example, the principles of Roman law, sum quique pacta sum savanda alter non moderi onsidere, this, this is another way of describing this social structure. And I think a very helpful way because in the law, the rubber hits the road. And the law is actually straightforwardly normative and it tells you what we have to do. And these are, these are principles that were, three of them began in 533 with the publication of Justinian's Institutes, which said, well, the law has three basic principles, as later Newton's Procipio was to have three basic principles for, for physics. Uh, Marx's famous phrase is property, freedom, equality, and Bentham, where Bentham is a stand-in for, for self-interest. It's a part, of, a part, an integral part of the dominant social structure that people act from self-interest. That's very clear in Adam Smith, for example. Adam Smith says that uh, in, for, in his theory of price and wages and rent, in his theory of rent, uh, Smith postulates the landlord charges. How much does the landlord charge? As much as he possibly can. <laughs> And that is not an empirical observation for Smith. That is what would happen under conditions of perfect liberty. So this is, a, this, this is the advocacy of a type of social order. It's not a, strictly an empirical account of how what Adam Smith observes uh, around him. This has a homostatic character. What do I mean by homostatic character? Well, again, it's what I observed in Chile that uh, when uh, the regime of accumulation is perturbed, when uh, investor confidence starts to flag and people start being laid off and uh, GNP becomes negative, um, there are automatic mechanisms which come into play to restore the uh, regime of accumulation. The re regime of accumulation does not die quietly. Uh, <laughs> it, it fights back. Uh, in the case of, I mentioned at the first, it fought back with extreme military force. It, uh, it, it literally murdered the people who were uh, perturbing it, and then it put into effect a very simple neoliberal regime of accumulation. It passed a statute of guarantees for foreign investors that destroyed the labor unions, that cut wages, it did things to increase profits uh, so that there would be investor confidence, so that there would be a functioning uh, economy again. The inevitability of the regime of the What do I mean by that? Uh, the law of substitution says that the less efficient ways of making profits will be replaced by the more efficient ones. 
So as time goes on, you can, this can also be seen in, in terms of Marx's procedure in the first 25 chapters of Capital, where he starts with simple exchange, and he goes through what he calls a series of value forms. But this series of value forms can also be regarded as a sketch of what tends to happen in history, that the more effective ways of profit making tend to uh, eliminate the less effective ones. Uh, in, in that, it, as a matter of economic theory, we go from um, selling in order to buy to buying in order to sell, and then we go to uh, investing, end up with regimes of accumulation where the life of the people physically depends on a regime of accumulation, uh, which uh, in our time has become, according to Emmanuel Waller's time, worldwide, so that the social sciences have only one object of study, which is the global economy, according to Waller's time. Um, <coughs> So the, uh, the separation of the wealth from the government was part and parcel of the constitution of the currently dominant system in early modern Europe. I'll come back to this in a second lecture. Uh, this, this social structure that we live with uh, did not just happen. It has a, it has a time when it, when it was created, when it began to exist. Uh, and it, it, it began to, and the, I, I can saw a couple of the sort of key points in the beginning of existence. One of them would be the glorious revolution in, in England in uh, 1689, uh, the, where the, uh, the uh, king, uh, for the first time, was invited to be king by the parliament and had to serve on the parliament's terms and had to accept that the only source of income would be taxes voted by the parliament. And then a few years later, in 1692, the Bank of England was founded, which made money something that private banks would create it became the model for our system today where 90, more than 99 95% of our money is created by banks private banks uh, back in the old days it was different back in only 1644 just a few years earlier the british had captured a spanish galleon laden, laden with silver and the, uh, the the sailors handed the silver over to the king the king sent it to the mint the mint minted it and sent it back to the king the king was the owner of the booty. This was the old way of doing things that had been going on for centuries. But this changed with the coming of modernity. So the coming of modernity uh, literally meant limited government. It meant government which is separated from the wealth of the country. The wealth of the country is in the hands of private people. And if it doesn't, so the government loses legitimacy. So we have governments which are deliberately designed to be unable to cope with problems that require large amounts of money. Um, as, a, as a legacy of how our system is, as, as, as the social contract. Uh, uh, the, so the main traditional methods of social change are inadequate because they don't change the basic cultural structure. They don't really work that much at the cultural level. Uh, if you arm struggle or electoral politics or organizing labor unions or engaging in manifestations uh, have a tendency to, uh, to work with the, uh, with the existing um, um, uh, with the existing norms and to try to enforce them. But I'm going to argue that we, we require what Gaston Bachelard called an epistemological break at this point. We have to, uh, for what, what does Bachelard mean by an epistemological break? Well, one thing he means is that uh, <coughs> science has to fight common sense. And common sense no longer works for us. You know, c common sense tells us, well, Scandinavian social democracy went into decline because it went into conflict with economic reality. End of story. Um, South Africa is suffering because of a lack of investment. Therefore, the president sends out emissaries to try to bring in more foreign investment because we need it. We depend on it. End of story. That is, common sense works within the regime of accumulation we have and within the regime of the Tausch principle organized by exchange. So to move out of it, uh, we need to have a scientific effort to uh, overcome common sense. I think that uh, ends my uh, half hour. Let me say just, just one more thing. And that is that um, the um, plurality favors governability. So one of the things that uh, we do with uh, solidarity economy is we curb the power of capital by making it less essential. Uh, the needed 
methods for transformation refute in practice Thatcher's slogan, there's no alternative to neoliberalism. That is, we actually construct uh, alternatives, and these have to be alternatives that do something for people in the present time. There are uh, acts of solidarity which solve present problems, but they do it in a way that has strategic significance because it reduces the physical dependence of humanity uh, on the uh, strength of the confidence of investors. <laughs>